Hello everybody, this is Joe Morrison from St. Mary of Redford. Today I want to talk to you about prayer. This talk is meant to be just a beginning primer on what is prayer and how to pray. Now, to begin with, a basic definition of prayer is conversation with God. And always remember that means there are two sides to it. On the one hand, there's talking to God. There's also listening for him to respond. Now, the how-to of prayer can be varied. A lot of people use stock prayers when they pray. So think of the Our Father, the Hail Mary, the Glory Be, right? These are prayers that we memorize and we sort of have in our back pocket, and they're very helpful. In times where we don't know what to say to God, they give us some suggestions on, this is what we can say to Him. This is how we praise Him. This is how we thank Him. This is the things we ask from Him. Um, or the things we should ask from him. So stock prayers are extremely helpful and I highly recommend them. In fact, the Our Father is the prayer given to us by Jesus himself. So memorizing prayers is a good thing. The second method I'm gonna offer to you is speaking to God from the heart as one friend to another. This is the way Moses was said to pray uh, in the book of Exodus. It says that God, Moses spoke to God as one friend does to another. Sometimes this is called colloquy. Um, so the basic idea is, let's say you come to the end of your day and you want to say some prayers before bed. Well, what do you say to God? Well, just tell him what's on your heart. right? Let him into all the joys, all the struggles, um, all the things you're feeling, you're struggling with, you need, you want to say to him, just open your heart to him. Be perfectly transparent before him. This is another excellent way to pray. The third way to pray, this is the one modeled by St. Mary Magdalene, is just to sit in silence with him. Maybe you've had those kind of friendships where the two of you know each other well enough that you don't need to say anything to each other to enjoy each other's company. It's enough just to be together. Sometimes our relationship with God can be like that. So sometimes you may not have words, and that's okay. Just sit with him. Maybe you come to the church. Jesus is present there in the Blessed Sacrament. Just sit at his feet, the way Mary Magdalene did. That's enough. He wants our love. He doesn't need anything more than that. The fourth way I recommend to pray is with scripture. There are two basic methods that I'm familiar with behind this. One is, uh, one favored by the Benedictines, it's called Lexio. And this is where you take a relatively short passage of scripture and you slowly read through it, chewing on each phrase. And when something sticks out to you and you feel something catch your mind or catch your heart, you, you stop there, read it again, chew it through. And you just keep chewing until, okay, I feel like I've chewed enough there, I can move on. There'll be some passages that don't strike you. It's okay. You don't have to get something out of each section but when it does strike you, our, our Lord's working something there. He's trying to tell you something. So take a moment to see what that is. I find that the uh, lectionary readings are actually a very useful way to find reasonably length readings to do this with. If you just open the Bible and try to find a passage to pray over, it can be kind of overwhelming because you have a lot of choices. Where do I start? Where do I finish? So just sit down. Take the readings from the day for the daily Mass or the Sunday Mass. Um, sometimes the first reading might strike you. Sometimes it might be the Gospel. But that's a, that's a reasonable length to do Lexio over. Other way to pray with Scripture, uh, and this is one of my favorites, um, is Ignatian meditation. So in this particular method, usually you do it with a Gospel passage. The first step is to say a preparatory prayer. So you invite God's grace into this period of prayer. You ask for his light, you ask for his help, so that you 
see, hear, understand through this passage whatever it is he wishes to teach you. Then you read through the passage once, slowly. Once you've read through it once, you begin imagining the scene. Build it step by step. So let's say you're meditating on the call of St. Peter. So St. Peter is fishing. So imagine the Sea of Galilee. Imagine the smell of the air, the feel of the sand under your feet. Imagine the waves lapping up on the shore. Jesus is preaching on the shore. So imagine what the crowd looks like around him. Imagine what, what, what might he be talking about. Um, John uh, and James are mending their nets with their father Zebedee. Picture that over or off to the side. Right? So imagine the scene. The sights, the sounds, the smells, all of it. And then let it unfold with you as one of the characters in it. So maybe you have the role of Peter in this. And you're watching this scene unfold through the eyes of St. Peter. So you're seeing Jesus come with the crowd. Um, and you're wondering, well, who is this guy? And then this guy that you don't know asks to borrow your boat. What are you thinking? What are you feeling as that's happening? This guy who you don't know tells you, go throw your net on the other side for a catch. And you know he's not a fisherman. You've been fishing all night and caught nothing. Well, who does he think he is? What are you thinking? What are you feeling? And then what's your reaction when you feel that first tug at the net and it's full? What are you thinking? What are you feeling? Right? You could also be John, watching this from over to the side, seeing, oh my goodness, Peter just got a miraculous catch. What's your reaction to that? Or maybe you were somebody in the crowd. And be attentive to, to where God might be prompting you. But the idea is, is you've entered into the scene. At the end of, again, imagining the scene play out in front of your eyes, speak to Jesus about what just happened. Imagine Jesus and have a conversation with him. Sometimes we'll find that actually Jesus himself answers, that you start hearing responses that did not come from your imagination. Sometimes it's just an imaginative exercise. It depends. Pay attention to whoever bore fruit, um, and then repeat. Okay, so those are methods of prayer. Pretty straightforward. Anybody could do at least one of these. But there's another side of prayer I want to talk about. Because remember, prayer isn't algorithmic. It's not like doing arithmetic where you take one, you add two, and you get three, right? It's not just a matter of, well, if I say the right types of prayers, then God will be pleased and God will talk to me. Uh, God does what he wants, right? It's a relationship. And you'll find that there are different stages in this relationship, like there is with any stage. There's the early stage where you're just getting to know him. There are points in that relationship where things will get deeper um, and more intense. There will be other stages that will feel more rocky. There's a reason for all of them. So if you're beginning prayer, I just want to give you a heads up about how some of this can can look and feel, and I'll, I'll give you some examples from the Bible to show you. So for a lot of people, maybe they've been praying a long time, maybe they've never tried praying before, but it can feel like God is far distant, out in heaven, somewhere else, maybe I'll meet him after I die, but certainly not in this life, because I don't see him work in this world, I don't hear his voice in this world. So I believe he's there, but it's almost kind of like a sort of blindness, right? I don't see him. 
for people in this place, and I think this is probably the majority of people, your position is like that of blind Bartimaeus in Mark chapter 10. Blind Bartimaeus is sitting outside the walls of Jericho, and Jesus is passing by. Now, he can't see Jesus. He's heard of him, clearly, because he calls out Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. But he's never talked to him. Um, and he can't, he can't be certain that he's actually out there. He's taking people's word for it. But when Jesus passes by, Bartimaeus starts praying. He calls out to Jesus. And in the moment, it probably feels like a cry out into the dark. Because that's Bartimaeus' world. It's dark. He doesn't see. But what happens? Well, Jesus is out there. And Jesus says, call him. So Bartimaeus is told, come, he's calling you. He goes up to Jesus. Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? He says, Master, I want to see. And Jesus restores his sight. Bartimaeus gets up, goes, follows him along the way. So for some people, this is what happens when they begin prayer. They don't expect a response from God. They figure, why not give it a shot? So they throw it out into the dark, and to their shock, well, Jesus responds. And there can be that moment for certain people where their eyes are open and they recognize him. They recognize, oh my goodness, that's you. I see you. I hear your voice. You're there, and you're wonderful. I tell this story a lot. Um, I tell it because it's sort of my conversion story, so I'm going to offer it to you too. Big turning point in my life was when I was 14 years old. I was at Mass, it's the Feast of Corpus Christi. I heard a sermon on the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. At that point in my life, I kind of figured, well, God might be real, but I'll never actually know for certain until I die. Because I don't hear his voice here on earth, I don't see him working, so it's a total leap in the dark to say that God even exists. Which meant that prayer was a total leap in the dark too at the time. I did pray, but I wasn't sure that anybody was hearing my prayers, and I certainly didn't expect a response. So I'm at Mass that day, and I hear this priest saying that the Eucharist is literally Jesus, which sounds absurd. Right, This thing looks like a piece of bread, and as far as I can tell, acts like a piece of bread, doesn't look like a human being, and certainly doesn't look like a divine human being. So this is silly. He kept digging in. I kind of scoffed at him. But I started to wonder as I'm sitting in the pew, well, what, what if this is actually true? If, logically, if Jesus was serious when he said, this is my body at the Last Supper, I mean, he, he could be serious, and if he was, he can do anything. So that would mean that he's standing right in front of me in the tabernacle in the front of the church. I just wondered for a moment, what if? In that moment, it was like my eyes were opened. That tabernacle started radiating this, this intense, it's like burning joy. It was the happiest I'd ever felt in my life. I felt like my heart was on fire. I felt like light was radiating out of my limbs. I was totally overwhelmed. I felt dwarfed in front of this guy who was in front of me. It was so obviously him. There was no question in my mind that that was Jesus. And I never, ever expected to meet him this side of heaven. It's like Bartimaeus. You throw the prayer out in the dark. To your shock, Jesus responds. Your eyes are open and you see him. And this changes everything. Okay, so that's one stage of the spiritual life. The next is that period of time where you're following Jesus and you feel like you see things clearly. It's all new, right? You're like the apostles following behind Jesus. Like St. Peter, after he 
got his miraculous catch of fish, he dropped everything, he went and followed Jesus, and he's seeing these miracles happen all around him. He's hearing Jesus preach, and he's soaking it all in, and this is terrific. And you don't understand how anybody could live away from Jesus, and you just want to spend all your time talking to Jesus and listening to Jesus, and you'd do anything for him. And you may not even get totally everything that's going on, but man, are you all in. Well, that's another stage of the spiritual life. It's a very happy one. What you have to remember when you're in that stage is that there is still deeper to go. And this brings us to the third stage. For most Christians, many Christians, there comes a stage of sifting, shall we say, where Jesus desires to draw us deeper. When we're seeing miracles happen all around us, when we hear his voice, when we know so obviously how much he loves us, it's very easy to, to love on a more superficial level than we would like. We love him because he does really good things for us. But there's a deeper form of love. And that's the love that loves even when it hurts, even when it costs. We love him because of who he is. So for St. Peter, this moment came at the Last Supper. Jesus is about to go to his crucifixion. And Peter swears that he would follow him even to death. And Jesus turns to him and says, would you die for me, Peter? Satan has demanded to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed that your faith may not fail. And when you turn back, you must strengthen your brothers. So all the faith that Peter carried with him for those two, three years of following Jesus, suddenly things went dark. When Jesus is arrested, Peter is deeply shaken. He starts to follow him. He gets to the courtyard where Jesus is being tried. And he fails. He denies him three times. Nothing is adding up the way he thought it was going to. He thought he was following the victorious Messiah, the king in the line of David, and this king that he was convinced was going to be triumphant has now been arrested, he's been crucified. This is all absurd. Nothing makes sense, and Peter can't handle it. It's dark. St. Paul has a similar moment. St. Paul talks in 2 Corinthians 12, about having had this experience at one point of being raised to the third heaven. He saw God and knew a joy unlike most people ever get to experience. But what happened? Well, he says God gave him an angel of Satan to beat him to keep him from being proud, a thorn in the flesh. And he begged God three times to take this away. But what was God's answer? My grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. You see the sifting happening. One moment, you see things clearly, and there's all sorts of joy in the spiritual life. And you know so obviously that God is with you. But then he desires to draw you deeper, and things become dark, right? And temptations that you didn't expect start coming. The faith that was so clear starts to feel more muddy. And you wonder, well, why would God let this happen? But he does. Power is made perfect in weakness. So be aware, this is a thing. The last thing to remember, though, is that all these people eventually came through it, that the darkness doesn't last forever. Um, eventually, there is heaven for those who persevere, of course, but usually in this life, that period of trial ends, or at least it breaks. Our Lord comes in to strengthen those who are bearing through these trials for him. So don't give up. Other thing to remember is, you pray differently when things are dark than when things are light. 
right? So speaking from your heart to God is very easy when you're in, in the light, when you're in consolation, as St. Ignatius would say. It can be much more difficult when you're in desolation or when things are dark, okay? That's okay. It's not your fault. In the darkness, stock prayers like the Our Father are very useful because it's hard for you to think of things to say to God, right? Um, meditation might be harder in times of desolation. It might be hard for you to picture scenes from the Bible or to enter affectively into the life of Christ. That's okay. We can still pray. We just might have to find other ways to do it. So, in short, knowing how to pray is more than just about knowing the methods of prayer. And different methods of prayer are going to be more helpful depending on where we're at in our spiritual life. This will change month to month, year to year, even sometimes day to day. Be patient with yourself. The key is, is that you're entering into a relationship with God. The sort of conversation you'll have, you'll have with Him will vary based on the place you are in your relationship with him. I hope this helped. I hope that this guides you into a deeper prayer life. Um, and all of my prayers for you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.